Our story starts in 8089 Chicago, with a group of women who are brought together by tragedy. They all came from all walks of life and held a variety of beliefs. Some of them were involved in philanthropy, while others were educators. Some were even part of the infamous suffrage movement that had been spreading through the country like wildfire. Normally, these diverse, colorful characters would have never met, but now they were all united under one goal. You see, some 18 years earlier, their beloved city had been all but ruined by a great fire. Burning for two days, the Great Chicago Fire had killed 300 people, destroyed 3.3 square miles of the city, and left more than a thousand residents homeless. It was a terrible disaster that would have ruined lesser people. But Chicago had survived and its residents had thrived. Our group of activist women wanted to show the entire world their city's resilience and recovery. As such, led by American philanthropist Emma Glisson Wallace, they had been lobbying to make Chicago the site for one of the most exciting events of the upcoming decade, the 1883 World's Fair Columbian Exposition. Designed to celebrate the anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World, the event was a huge affair. It was supposed to last for months and showcase hundreds of achievements from the world of science and art. Beyond making Chicago the site, Emma and her group also wanted to ensure that women and their achievements would be properly represented at the fair. In order to do that, they were petitioning for the establishment of something called the Women's Department for the Fair. It was a long and grueling process, but their hard work paid off. In 1890, President Benjamin Harrison signed a bill into law. He not only named Chicago as the site of the World Fair, but he also approved the creation of a board of lady managers. For the record, this was the actual name they used. I didn't come up with it. Numbering 117 members, the board of lady managers was composed of two women from each state, territory, and the District of Columbia, as well as members at large. The main duty of the lady manager board was to supervise the design and construction of a new building called the Women's Building at the Fair. This building was designed to showcase works by women from every field imaginable, from fine arts to science and home economics. It had exhibition spaces, an assembly room, a library, and a hall of honor. It was a complete triumph for Emma and her group, and we can only imagine how happy and proud she was when she took her place as one of the lady managers. The president of the lady manager board was Mrs. Bertha Palmer, and she was also quite the character. At 21, she had married 44-year-old Chicago millionaire Porter Palmer, who owned the Palmer House Luxury Hotel. A year later, the Great Chicago Fire struck and it completely devastated their business. So, at 22, Bertha found herself close to being destitute. In the aftermath of the fire, she worked hard together with her husband to rebuild their fortune. She quickly rose to the top of Chicago society and gained a reputation as a formidable writer, politician, and administrator there really was no better person to put in charge of the lady manager board. Chicago's story of recovery was Bertha's story. As a working woman in a society that catered almost exclusively to men, showcasing the achievements of women was probably very important to her. Making Chicago's World Fair and the women's building a success was most likely very personal to Bertha. With that determination, Mrs. Palmer involved herself in every single aspect of the women's building, from the architecture to the curation of the artworks and the books in the library. She even got Congress to mint the new coin with the impression of the Spanish Queen Isabella on it. Make no mistake, Bertha was a very impressive lady. So up to this point in our story, you're probably very confused. After all, you're promised the story of the brownie and I have been babbling on about great fires and women empowerment and world fairs. Well, if there's one thing you need to remember about brownies is that probably they wouldn't have happened without Bertha's sheer determination to make the women's building a success. As I mentioned beforehand, she was involved in every single aspect of the building. With her keen attention to detail, she unsurprisingly noticed that something was off in the food department. The box lunches that were served at the women's building had pie as a dessert. 
but pies were too big and impractical for women. Considering the amount of work she probably had on her plate, most people would have most likely ignored this fact and moved on with their lives. Mrs. Palmer, however, was clearly not most people. So in her quest for absolute perfection, she turned to one of her husband's hotel chefs. She asked him to create a dessert, specifically a ladies dessert that was smaller than a pie and edible without getting a lady's gloved fingers dirty. We don't know how many tries it took and we definitely don't know how long the chef worked on it, but the result was a small, sweet, chewy piece of happiness. <laughs> Calling for double the amount of chocolate we use today and topped with an apricot glaze, the first brownie was born. Mrs. Palmer's new dessert delighted the visitors of the women's building. The exhibition itself was such an incredible celebration of women's contribution to art and science that it ended up empowering other women and inspiring them to showcase their own works. Following the World Fair, until the end of her life, Mrs. Bertha Palmer continued to be a strong promoter of working women and to amaze Chicago society with her business acumen. In fact, 16 years after her husband's passing, she had managed to double the value of the estate he had left her. As for the brownie, well, the brownie was so successful that today, more than 125 years later, the recipe is still served at the Hilton Palmer House under the name Palmer House Brownie. I don't know about you, but I would really, really, really love to try that particular brownie. It sounds absolutely amazing. During the following decades, a couple of hundreds of cookbook authors taking the original Palmer recipe and publishing variations of it created a consensus among the general public. In the public's mind, a brownie became a chocolate-baked good with a rich, moist texture given by its ratio of more sugar than flour. 